right. Well, uh, you, you ready to go? Shall I intro us? I go, I go my intro down. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna nailed. I'm gonna be totally professional for this first episode, and then like the rest is just gonna be shit again. That's, <laughs> that's my trajectory. <laughs> hey, fuck it. You're watching bad adaptations. <laughs> The show where we sort the bad adaptations from the good adaptations. I am your good friend, Owen Adams. And with me is my good friend, Jonathan Kadok. How you doing, sir? Doing all right. And you heard him right. I'm his good friend, not your good friends. So. Yeah, don't, you be, don't you be sidling up to my good friend, trying to, trying to win him over for your good friend collection. <laughs> I am that kind of lady. <laughs> well, yeah. What kind of lady are you? I'm a lady in red. Wouldn't it be weird if you asked someone and they were just like, I'm type 11. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> because then you would wonder, are they weird or am I missing some critical information? <laughs> I, I used option D when I did my character creator. Oh. Pretty much. So if you're wondering what's going on here, uh, you shouldn't be because we've been teasing this for like <laughs> like a week now. But this is our new show. It's called Bad Adaptations. And it's the show where we look at movies. It's it's one of your classic movie podcasts. That's what we, we do. Thought, we thought we'd do something a little bit different. Every every movie podcast needs a gimmick, you know? Like, um... Like, uh... I've forgotten all movie podcasts. But you know, like, I mean, like, like Starsky and Hutch had the car, you know? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, the Avengers have, uh, Samuel L. Jackson. We've yeah. got... Um, Wait, did you just call Samuel L. Jackson a gimmick? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't he? <laughs> Isn't oh, that how that boy. works? Um, I, hope we, I hope we never get big enough to one day we have to answer for that. Hey, we'll make up to him the first time we do a, an adaptation with him in. So mm -hmm. our thing is we're looking at movies where they are taken from one source material to, to the movie, the movie world. Doesn't have to be any particular source material. We're going to be doing books, games. Uh, we've got a poem coming up at one point. <laughs> We, we, we're doing all right. Um, yeah, I could do that. Those exist. Yeah, we, we got one. We, we discussed one. We got, I got one on the list. I've got, I've got one based on a poem. Okay. Uh, uh, it's a certain Zemeckis motion capture movie. Oh. So, so how, how have you been since last I spoke to you, John, before we get into our source material? Are, are you well? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm doing great. A little cold, but I'm good. Well, yeah, you're, you're over in Wisconsin, right? Yeah. And Which, we're currently dealing with the... Uh, not to date the episode or nothing, but we're currently dealing with the a polar vortex situation. Well, I, well, I, I have subarctic weather. You, you don't need to tell me about Wisconsin because all I need to know about Wisconsin I've learned <laughs> from today's movie. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get into it. Uh, so, so, what is today's movies? Well, yeah, let's get into it. Today's movie uh, for our inaugural episode is Atlas Shrugged, Part One. Minus Mulligan. Who's asking? Someone who knows what it's like to work for himself and not let others feed off the profits of his energy. Who are you? We found a note. What did it say? It said, who is John Galt? One of the worst railroad accidents in recent history. A Taggart transcontinental freight train has crashed and derailed. I have to get the Rio Norte completely re-railed in nine months, and I'm gambling your new metal can do what you say it can. I'm staking my business on it. Nobody's used rude and metal. Why do we have to be the first? Well, they say you're intractable, you're ruthless, your only goal is to make money. My only goal is to make money. Yeah, but you shouldn't say it. If we're gonna bring Reardon down, we should do it from the inside. I am placing a moratorium on all we can't afford to allow the expansion of a company which produces too much. A federal tax will be applied to all steel mills. They are not getting my metal. We'll find a way to fix this. You and your brother try to undermine me or go to the government. Maybe way. you should let me explain. Maybe you should let me finish speaking. It's a battle. What battle? I don't fight the disarm. Well, they have a weapon against you. 
What is wrong with the world? Well, I ask useless questions. How deep is the ocean? How high is the sky? Who is John Galt? In order to save my family's business, I'm gonna have to abandon it. I'm gonna take a leap and start my own company. And what are you gonna call this new line of yours? The John Galt line. We're not gonna allow you to run that train. You can do whatever you want with your men, Mr. Brady, but that train will run if I have to drive the damn thing myself. What we're doing, my metal, your railway, it's us who move the world. If you double-cross me, I will destroy you. To a successful business partnership. I'll drink to that. Which came yeah. out in the distant past of, I think, 2011. This is information I should have written down in my notes, and I didn't. Um, mm -hmm. Atlas Shrugged, part one, based on the first sort of half, I would guess. I don't think it's like an even third, third, third split across these three movies, but it's like the first the first act of the 1957 novel by Ayn Rand. And, Our uh, favorite author. And because we're being, we're being formal, skilled good boys this time, <laughs> uh, I'm going to give you a little, little bit of information about the movie Atlas Shrugged. For those who have never seen it, yeah. here's the Wait rundown. Here, here are the deets. Uh, directed by that famous director, Paul Johansson. No idea. Um, <laughs> in the not-too-distant future, an international oil crisis seals, sees rail transportation make a resurgence in the United States. Taylor Schilling of Orange is the New Black plays Dagny Taggart, a young executive at a transport firm inherited from her father. Uh, Dagny has some bold ideas to lead the company to success, but is blocked by her brother and business partner, James, played by Matthew Marsden. Uh, while Dagny pursues profits, James sees the company's role as a force for social good, not just for profit. Uh, meanwhile, high-profile businessmen and entrepreneurs are disappearing. Uh, when their whereabouts are investigated, the only answer witnesses can provide is the mysterious question, who is John Galt? After one of Taggart Transportation's trains derails, threatening a very lucrative contract, uh, Dagny wants to replace the old line with a groundbreaking but untested new metal invented by entrepreneur Henry Reardon, played by Grant Bola. All these famous names. Uh, Reardon. <laughs> Reardon metal is apparently sure. superior in every way to traditional steel, but Reardon's success and sole ownership of the metal is seen as a danger by the government uh, and his business rivals because it would create a monopoly in the market. To counter this, the government spreads a rumor that Reardon metal is unsafe. James blocks Dagny's attempts to adopt the metal. Dagny, in response, breaks with the company and attempts to rebuild the line as a new independent company. After Dagny and Reardon succeed in repairing the damaged line with Reardon metal, they travel with the first shipment across the new rails, proving the metal to be safe, but their triumph is short-lived as the government, working with Dagny's brother James, succeed in passing aggressive an aggressive anti-competition law. Finally, Dagny's most viable client Valuable client, sorry, viable. <laughs> you sound like a fetus. Um, Ellis Wyatt uh, disappears after a meeting with a man who calls himself John Galt. Did I miss anything dramatically important there? Oh no, just just um, just uh, just Wisconsin. <laughs> Wisconsin. Well, it was. I mean, it was presented. Well, I, I suppose there are a few little bits in there that are kind of relevant, but not really. Um, Dagny and Reardon begin a, begin kind of a romance. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also a the beginning of a plot involving the discovery of a revolutionary new engine. Yeah. But that's 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 the gist of it. I would say so, if, if you. Uh, I, I will say that um, just for the sake of being complete here uh imdb does list this as for genre as a drama mystery sci-fi film yes yeah, it's it's set in the distant future of 2016 which i looked up <laughs> <laughs> i looked up and was a little alarmed by because if you consider it this was move this movie was made 2011 so they were expected mm. to be five years into the future right. and yet a major plot point in this film is that international troubles have led to the resurgence of the rail, but this is an inherited railway. Right. <laughs> like it, <it's, laughs> that has apparently only recently fallen into hard times. Um, like, like, it doesn't quite gel with the idea that, like, the client Ellis Wyatt is basically saying, like, I carried my goods on this railway for years, and now you've started... 
to fall apart. When right. apparently we're, we're in the middle of, like, Rail's second golden age. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think, I think you, you nailed all the, the major points to the film. Yeah. Well, we, we'll, we'll, there's lots of stuff we're going to get into in more detail, but that's, that's kind of the gist of it. If you've never seen this before, it is uh, worth mentioning. It's a... I would say this is an independent movie. Um, it's, yeah. It's, it, um, in terms of it was definitely financed... <laughs> Um, by the creators. It, well, it's a it, it yeah, by a sole billionaire, pretty much, right? Right. <laughs> like this is this is the 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 entrepreneurial spirit in practice, not just in philosophy, you know. Mm-hmm. By uh, by a sort of a Henry Reardon of the movie world, I presume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> but the thing is, after you see this movie, I'm not sure that's a compliment. Oh. Like. <laughs> Henry Reardon, I, he's the character I want to talk about the most, I think, as we get into it. So, because we're, we're being structured, so, Structured Good Boys, is, that's, that was my alternate title for the show, Structured Good Boys. Um, we, we got, we're breaking the show into kind of segments. We got, we got three questions yeah. that I think are like the valuable questions you have to answer when you're talking about any adaptation. The first of which is, were you familiar with the source material before seeing the movie? Uh, I was. I'm putting it to you. Uh, I was familiar with it. I have not read the entire book. Uh, I did try to start <laughs> reading it at one point. I tried to start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I succeeded in starting, but not much more than that. Uh, I, and truth be told, I was suckered in to reading this book. Uh, one... Because I had read a Ayn Rand book before. Is it Ayn, Ayn Rand, right? <laughs> Ayn Rand. This is funny. <laughs> um, I, I always say Ayn. That, that seems Ayn. to be where I go. But you know what? I can honestly say I've never heard, like, I've never heard anybody who knew her say it. So. <laughs> just, she's just that one lady over there. I mean, I, I, I was going to say I've never heard, like, an Ayn Rand interview or anything like that, but. The only way that would actually help you if she was like a Pokemon who could only say <laughs> Ayn Rand. <laughs> Go Ayn Rand. Use objectivism theory. <laughs> Why should I? What do I get out of it? <laughs> Opponent is confused and baffled and slightly <laughs> enraged. Um. Opponent has slightly less faith in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Opponent decides to open a coffee shop. (laughs) You'd win. (laughs) Snorlax just gets up and he's like, I just can't deal with this shit anymore. It's just. It's not the world I want to live in. Just leaves the arena, just slunks off. (laughs) It's like, I'm done. Snorlax, come back! What's the point? There'll always be people like them in the world. (laughs) That's off from down the hill. <laughs> Opponent gives up altruistic desires. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, so I, I was suckered into reading this one because I thought the cover was cool. Uh, two, I had, I had, <laughs> and, and and give it credit, uh, the covers for Alice Shrugged are kind of cool. <laughs> they're uh, they're good, good marketing, good uh, design yeah. work behind them. I mean, book covers at that time are great. Right. For some reason, the Ayn Rand ones seem to have preserved their kind of, um, their legacy of, as like the Art Deco art cover franchise. Right, you know right. I mean? like, oddly enough, she kind of formed a monopoly around the, <laughs> uh, the Art Deco design for book covers. Uh, Without a doubt. Other than that, I, I had read a uh, Ayn Rand book previously i read anthem which i spoke with Owen before about this but uh anthem is definitely i feel the most science fiction that ayn rand goes and and because of the very very specific world that that book is in her weird philosophies sort of make sense in that one right uh right because but, it, sh- it should be said about atlas shrugged it is a very generous 
definition of science fiction that includes yeah. this book. Mm-hmm. I would uh, say. So yeah, I, I did attempt to read this after reading that, and I realized very quickly that the <laughs> the same sort of philosophies that worked in Anthem, uh, the book, not the upcoming game. Although, what if it be great if it was? I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, I'll be there. Uh, but the same philosophies that worked in Anthem, I did not feel worked in Alice Shrugged, and in fact became very, very depressing <laughs> while trying to read. Yeah. So personally, I will say, I have actually never read any Ayn Rand. My introduction to Ayn Rand and objectivism was, and this is such a, uh, such a, an unfortunate answer, because I think it's so common these days, but <laughs> it was Bioshock. Um, yeah, yeah. Which, Bioshock is a very direct take on Ayn Rand. Uh, mm-hmm. And a very, um, a very sophisticated attack on it, actually, for a video game. Uh, yeah, th- for th- sure. Works quite well in that if you're not interested, it will completely go over your head. But if you are familiar with Ayn Rand, it's, I mean, it's scathing, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are very few games out there that are overtly out there for the purpose of destroying a political philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> and Bioshock kind of does. Um, you know, the, the villain in Bioshock is a guy called uh, Andrew Ryan, which is a little like Ayn Rand, and he right. wants to take his people away to a perfect society, which in the distant future when we get into Atlas Shrugged Part 3 is very relevant. Like It is mm-hmm. a, um, a... Rapture is the potential... Uh, outcome for John Galt's uh, ultimate plan in the novel. Right. So, okay, uh, well, not to get we ahead of start, ourselves. Yeah, start, before we start teasing stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, you're you're familiar with uh, Alice Shrugged and Ayn Rand in general through Bioshock. Pretty much, I've I, after that because of sort of an interest, I've read around it, but I have never read the novel directly. So the first time I watched this movie, which was some time ago, I, I, this is actually this was my second watch through of this film. <laughs> oh. um, I I was going in familiar with Ayn Rand and what she was into, but not really familiar with the story itself, which I think might be the best way to experience this film, possibly. It, yeah, I, I would say that part of me wishes I could have seen this movie without having knowledge of objectivism yes. beforehand and because uh, I, I won't lie it paint it definitely skewed my watching experience yes well what what a knowledge of objectivism does I think is sort of pre-prepare you for what's coming whereas right. I think I think it would be more shocking at times <laughs> I think I, I, I think having a, an, a knowledge of objectivism going into this, <laughs> what it does, it kind of primes you to either agree or disagree or like or dislike yes. uh, the characters. You you um, can't go in fresh and just see right. what comes of them. Having said that, and we'll get to this in a moment, mm-hmm. I don't think it uh, it would have helped too much. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so my second question mm-hmm. is, we'll we'll probably breeze past this one a little quickly, but it'll. It'll come into to play more in future episodes, which is, does this work as an adaptation? Okay, does it work as an adaptation? So, I I'm gonna say no, um, specifically because with a book like Alice Shrugged, it is is so steeped in a philosophy, and it it, it basically is a vehicle for the philosophy itself. Yes. Um, with with a with a very uh, unnatural plot line wrapped around it, specifically to push the characters into a position where their philosophy seems like the best. Right. In fact, I would say we'll get into, I suppose, our final section, which is our, our main chunk of the show. We'll get into more about objectivism, I think. Yeah. But... One of the big weaknesses with this movie is, I think, as a vehicle for communicating objectivism, it actually does a really good job in explaining what objectivism is and what it's about. It does a really good job of explaining 
why people would support it and what the goal is. But it does a terrible job of selling objectivism because all <laughs> the people in this movie who are supposed to be objectivists don't read like normal human beings at all. Right. And, and so, like, with the book, you, you have the benefit of having a narration in a book. Um, the, the book can explain a little bit, like, okay, what's going on through their, the, the person's head? Uh, there's a little bit of a backstory. What, what are some of these motivations? And then they can, just, they can just tell you that in the book. And that's all very, very important for this specific story. Um, right. You have to know where these characters are coming from to really get why they are the way they are. Uh, in the movie, through, I will say, through the fault of the screenwriters, the directors, and the actors involved, uh, no one really conveys that. No one... Right. No one is... I mean, 2D, it feels like it's giving them too much credit. Everyone is right. so flat and basic and cliched. And they, it, they may as well be reading from Ayn Rand's The Virtue of Selfishness half the right. time. They, right. they may as well just be standing up and describing what Ayn Rand thought. And the difficulty is, I would say, weirdly enough, I would say the one character who works, fortunately, is Dagny, as close as anybody else. Because her, right. her motivation is quite simple. She is the person who wants to keep the company afloat. If you ignore objectivism for a moment, she wants to keep the company going while her brother keeps making shitty decisions, right? Right. That I mean, is almost relatable. She work, Her character works well in the movie because she is the reactionary character. Yes. Uh, she, she is the one who has to basically take the events that are happening around her, react to them, and then push the action forward right whereas uh, i would say riordan who in the book is supposed to be like the ultimate attractive guy right he's supposed to be the <laughs> model of perfect society mm -hmm. i think in this movie he reads as if he has a socialization problem yeah it, he, <laughs> if that makes sense like in the movie they, they really try to to push it as him being uh, just fed up and kind of disgusted with the people around him. But it, what it really comes off as is just having you know, falling somewhere on the spectrum. You know what I mean? Yes. It's right. I don't want, I don't ever want to use like autism as a, as a, uh, as a prerogative. Right. But this movie codes Henry Reardon as autistic. That's how he comes off. Not as, um, not as a man of unique ability to cut through the bullshit. He comes across as someone who is, on some level, incapable of connecting emotionally to the people around him. Right. And like I said, I don't, I don't mean to use autism as, as a pejorative term. No, what, I... what, what, what it comes across is, is that it's clear the intent is to be something completely different. The way it is acted and written makes it come off as just being... Uh, unable just yeah. just unable to socially you know. deficient yeah it's it's very strange he doesn't mm -hmm. come across as a charmer at all and i don't want to get into talking about the sequels because that's not mm -hmm. what about this episode's about too much what i will say is i watched the sequel last night and every character in this movie is recast and all those problems shift around to different people okay <laughs> <laughs> it's very uh -huh. unusual so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get led into that, yeah. but yeah. Uh, so I'd say that's so as an adaptation I think uh, so here's just something completely separate to the book and to objectivism and stuff like that. I would also say this movie has fallen into the trap of splitting a novel, and mm -hmm. what I will say is um, I don't think inherently it's easy to judge adaptations that are meant to be viewed as three novels and then judge how they they communicate the book. What I will say is, I don't actually think that's one area where this book, where this film particularly fails. While it does end on a cliffhanger, I think the story they tell is relatively complete and sort of thematically consistent. That's one area in which it sort of works. Sure, I would, I, I, would I, I would agree that they man they managed to break it up in enough where they they found the section of the movie or the of the book that can be. It, uh, 
could be its own little separate thing. Uh, the, the problem is, is that when you're dealing with this much bigger novel and, and there are two other Atlas Shrugged movies. Um, so we're talking about the first part of a saga. <laughs> and uh, uh, they what they do is they have to make events that happen in the book as sort of setup and lead-ins be major plot points in this film and i don't think they necessarily work so well because everything in this in this in this movie to me feels like lead up to a much bigger conflict later yes um and i i really am sad that i just said i won't talk about the sequel (laughs) 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 but i won't I'll be good. Because we're going to do that. We said we do that for like a one year anniversary show if we make it, right? We'll, right. We'll, return. Yep. We'll, we'll circle back this way. Yeah, we're coming so, back to Alice Shrugged if you guys make it happen. Before we move on to just talking about the film and getting into it, there is one one last thing I would like to say about the adaptation, which I think... Mm-hmm. Well, two things, which I think... I, I've said it a few times as we've talked about this, but I really do think the most unusual thing about this movie is that um, it treats its source material like scripture. So Mm -hmm. it's very, very unchanged. And we've talked about this a little bit on the last episode of the podcast we did, but um, it gives it this weird atonal sort of time effect where it seems oddly timeless, like adaptations of Shakespeare in the park, if you know what I mean. Okay. Which is unsettling, I think. And makes it very difficult to take the movie seriously because you know, even when it's set in the present day with like modern TVs and things like that, you know you're looking at this weird 1950s relic. Like, it, it feels like a movie from the 50s yeah, most it, of the time. I mean, you know what it really kind of feels like to me is... <laughs> do, you, do you remember that, that time, like, it happened in, in like, kind of the early 90s, and then it kind of happened again in the, like, early 2000s, where people tried to, like, bring back, uh, like, 1920s swing and swag? You know what right. I mean? Like... That's kind of what it feels like. It kind of felt like if I would have come across these people in the real world, like, playing out their lives, that's what I would feel like. Like, oh, you guys got really into this whole this whole right. scene well, the, thing, you know? Like, Well, the movie is sort of like the, the philosophical equivalent of that movie Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow. Right. <laughs> Do you remember that film? Yeah. It's like that, but, you know, tired old philosophies. And it's, right. it's one of those things where if it... If I didn't know better, I'd think it was one of those things that was supposed to be a comedy. It didn't quite work out like that. I mean, it's so... When you sit and you think about what movie this movie feels like the most, uh, they're all better films, but it feels like... Do you remember Superman Returns? When, like, the Daily Planet's all sepia, and everyone's talking, but no one's quite talking like a human being? Right. This movie could be set five years on from Superman Returns, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, Superman's I mean, gone again, and the world's all <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> and like, like, like I was saying, like it definitely feels to me like all everyone in this movie is doing some weird like uh, guerrilla theater. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> they're out there just in the real world playing this these parts and like trying to like right. interact with the world around them. And everyone and everyone else in the world and the world itself, like technology wise, is just kind of like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> right. I mean, do you like, remember that? Do you remember that like, sort of the Twilight Zone where everyone's got to be as happy as they can and espouse that they're great, otherwise that kid sends them to the cornfield. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like that. Yeah. I mean, it, like it really feels like they're like, uh, <laughs> like, like all these people like are super like wrapped up in like the railway and everything like that, but like the rest of the world is like, what are you guys doing? Like, yeah, we got planes over yeah, here. Yeah, we still got planes. <laughs> we, we, we no, got Timmy, boats. Timmy likes trains. They're like, I'm going to call someone up on my Blackberry. What are you doing? Like, we we all have iPhones and, <laughs> and galaxies. Like, uh, like <laughs> they, could, they couldn't afford that for the set. I, I will say, before we move on to our, our final question mm. and really get into this, I will say one thing from the sequel. There is a moment where they pass off a tablet in a tablet holder as an in-car TV in a luxury car. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. 
and it's it's really great because it's on its side so what you can see all the buttons <laughs> all the buttons are pointing like to the right up to the top of the screen <laughs> it's it's terrific um so on to the meat the final question okay do you think this works as a movie in its own right no no God, no, no. <laughs> No, no, take your time. Really think about your answer. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm bringing it in. All right, ask me again. <laughs> Do you think this works as a movie in its own right? No, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. This is this is the... We're giving you a peek behind the curtain. This is the main chunk of the show now. All that rest of that stuff is to make it look like we know what we're doing. <laughs> this movie no, is it's terrible. <laughs> it's, it's really bad. <laughs> Um, and and so, it's sad. It actually is sad for me. It's specifically for, or not, not that I have any care about Alex Trucks succeeding. It's actually some of these actors who are in this are not bad actors at all. Like that that kid from X Men First Class is in this kid who yeah. played Darwin. Um, like you know Taylor Schilling. She she's pretty good in Orange Is the New Black. Like, when I was looking at the when I was looking at the recasting. Because they recast everybody, right? Mm -hmm. No, no actor. I think the only act, the only person who plays a role in any of these movies who goes on to one of the sequels, is what's his name, Fox News guy, <laughs> like in, <laughs> in his role as a newsreader. Uh, uh, Hannity, Sean Hannity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like Taylor Schilling was in Argo. Like that, that movie won a, an Oscar. You know. It's... So, so when I looked through the recasting, they they asked the director, like the, the producer, the guy who's funding it all. And he was like, well, you know, availability is always an issue. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> Funnily enough, none of them were available <laughs> to come back. And who else you got? You got, uh, what's his name? The guy who played um, Quark in uh, Deep Space Nine pops right. up. What's yep. that actor's name? Oh, okay, uh, I can't remember. And, um, I mean, s some of them aren't bad. I thought the actor who played, um, uh, I thought the actor who played her brother wasn't terrible. Oh, you know, yeah, um, Marsden. He, he plays... Yeah, he plays conflicted, all right. Is he related to James Marsden, do you reckon? I don't know. They um, do kind of look a little similar. He, like, he could be, like, a younger brother. It was Matthew Marsden. We should, we should look it up. Yeah. But, um... Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's never nice It's to see all that money go on total shit, right? Like, the, nobody <laughs> wants to see that happen. I don't know. But, I thought it was kind of great. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, well, Matthew Marsden's British, so I, oh. I guess not. James Marsden's not British, is he? I don't know. I don't think. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Um, <laughs> Could be! <laughs> well, there you go, his American accent's not terrible. Yeah. Um, so, so, I really wanted you to watch this movie, because mm -hmm. I'd seen it, and, that, like, I don't know anyone else who actually sat down and watched it, right? Like, when this was coming out, and he was promoting it around and putting those press releases out... Everybody knew it was going to be a disaster, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> it, it was oddly enough the fire festival of movies, right? And the I remember the 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 best bit about it because the thing about this movie is it's legitimately unbelievable, right? And objectivism is inherently unbelievable, so it's a really difficult one to sell. Yeah. The first time I heard about this movie was when it was coming to DVD. They accidentally put a typo on the back of the DVD box that said it was about the virtue of selflessness. <laughs> and they had to correct it to the virtue of selfishness because some proofreader was clearly like <laughs> no <they're> just... <laughs> they obviously didn't mean that <laughs> that'd be ridiculous oh oh that is their philosophy <laughs> really okay right and so what you end up with is this bizarrely unbelievable movie i mean okay it's a car crash yeah. like I was talking to you last night because I was trying to write the summary that I read out at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> and the problem I was having was every summary I could come up with felt like it wasn't right because it makes the movie sound like it's about something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and, and so the biggest issue I feel with this movie actually stems from the novel itself. Right? Sure. Uh, I mean, you can't get away from that. You can't polish a turd. Right. Uh, like, I said, like I said, the book was a vehicle for the philosophy of objectivism. And it's written so ham-fistedly where it was, 
you know, the people who uphold the ideals of objectivism are these really great, uh, wealthy, intelligent, uh, charming people, right? And then everyone who has any sort of desire to help the common good or, you know, have any sort of uh, social awareness around them are, are depicted as just these hand-wringing uh, 1920s cartoon villains. I mean, there's right. there's like a scene where the guy has a cigar in his mouth, right? He's puffing away at this damn thing, right? Just huge clouds of smoke. <laughs> and one, by the way, he, he smokes it without taking a little wrapper off the back of it, which kind of bothers <laughs> the shit out of me. Too um, expensive to yeah. uh, <laughs> to actually smoke one. It's probably digital smoke. <laughs> yeah, like I don't think it was actually lit, but um, he he's he's smoking a cigar and he's uh, like smoking a pack of three all in the cellophane together. <laughs> like, oh yeah, <laughs> I sure do love these cigars. He, he just has a humidor press against his face. <laughs> um, but, with, with a big sticker on the bottom saying, Warranty void if seal broken. <laughs> don't, don't you break that fucking seal. <laughs> Inhale that humidor. <laughs> Can't afford this. <laughs> it's going to be back at the shop by nine. <laughs> Still see the tag hanging from it. <laughs> it was on clearance. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if you zoom in really closely. All the CGI scenes, there's a little like uh, Cinema 4D free edition. <laughs> Watermark. <laughs> <laughs> shark red just <laughs> um, but uh, so the, the problem is, is that everything is so overblown and just overwrought it's just nothing is believable nothing nothing comes across as human nothing comes off as and I'm not even one of these type of people who wants uh, unflinching realism in my films like I don't, I don't need that. Uh, in fact, I I, would, I just watched a great video the other day about. Um, yeah, so I watched in this this video the other day about Nick Nick Cage's acting style, and they they they're talking about how it's like this weird throwback to silent film, where the the idea was to be a, as almost as unrealistic as possible, because they're they're trying to convey. Uh, emotions and things without the use of voice right right um and so it comes off as very uh unnatural and that's what people liked so i and i and i and i have nothing, nothing against nick cage so i don't i don't feel the need to have like unflinching realism in movies right. but there has to be some semblance of uh, it being natural within the movie you know what i mean well, I, th I think what the issue is, and this must be, this is the most distressing thing about Atlas Shrugged. I think any normal person watches this movie, and what they see is, even if you are right-wing leaning, right? Mm -hmm. I think any normal human being, when they look at the people who are supposed to be the heroes in this movie, they see people they don't relate to acting in ways that seem weird and forced, because they don't seem like normal human values, right? Right. And then the villains don't seem believable because you're like, well, nobody... I know no villain truly thinks they're a villain, right? In a mm -hmm. good, in a well-written screenplay. But nobody sits there going, for the common good, and then does things that are blatantly not for the common good. <laughs> or, right. What's really interesting about Atlas Shrugged, and I think what's the most damning for objectivism, is that it is so utterly incongruous with reality when you watch it. You can't possibly see how it's supposed to work mm -hmm. and so what really makes Atlas Shrugged very distressing is that you realize that there are people out there who read that book and watch this movie and go yeah that makes sense with how I see the world and that's frightening right. I think well I mean and that's that's the weird thing right is uh, may maybe I could <laughs> I can change my answer to previously that this maybe this does work as a decent adaptation maybe not of the book but of, of objectivism because Objective in itself is a is a philosophy that can only be viable in a very specific situation that right will will never happen right <laughs> like this the 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 sort of the sort of world that would have to come about 
for objectivism to make any lick of sense uh, can't possibly exist because it would mean the, the, the concept of selfishness would have to disappear entirely for there to now be people as scions for selfishness. Right. I mean, for people who don't know, because I suppose we haven't really covered this, objectivism, Ayn Rand was a woman who believed that, fundamentally, objectivism, uh, is the right way to live your life is to be completely selfish, and then the good things that you do will benefit other people, because what's good for you is inherently good for other people anyway. Mm -hmm. And so everybody working, but that's not even why you should do it. People working towards their own self-interest will invent and make things that, as, an, as a byproduct, will move society along making things better for everybody. Therefore, you should completely deregulate all business, let everybody do what they want, basically, so long as they're not, you know, short of going out there killing people, you know what I mean? Right, right. Like libertarians. Um, <laughs> you, should just, you should just completely deregulate everything, because every time the government tries to intervene and help people... It's basically, A, stepping over someone else's God-given right to not have the government intervene, and B, um, making it worse. And so what's weird about Atlas Shrugged is it's a movie full of people who are trying to do the right thing to fix the society that is completely falling apart. Because it is. Industry is crumbling. America's in this huge, never-ending recession. Um, and all that the government and the various sort of business leaders who are trying to fix the problem are doing is getting in the way of the rich, powerful inventors who are actually trying to get the, the country moving again. And that's the movie's philosophy. Essentially, that government intervention is making this worse. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the thing, too. Like it's, it's trying so desperately to set up this, di this relationship between uh, people who... Are after their own self interest who, who, who value the their own creations more than anything else, and who, yeah, like you said, like who feel that by their amazingness, you know, by by their own awesome, awesome selves are going to make the world better. They they're really trying to set these people up as heroes, and then they're really really trying to set up everyone else as villains. And they go so far to do this that it's just like, is this a, is this a joke? Like, is it a parody? It... Right, well, it, it doesn't even work because one of the things that really kind of breaks the film is that all the people who are behaving selflessly are actually behaving selfishly. Right. They all have their own agendas. Like, they, you know, the, the people who are trying to crack down on... Uh, Henry Reardon, who's the... He's, like, the other main lead of the movie, I would say. He's, like, he's our, yeah. our, our second protagonist. <clears throat> yeah. He's a rich industrialist who's invented this magic metal that is, for reasons the movie never goes, goes into, stronger and better in every way than steel. And then whatever else they're using. Mm -hmm. And the reason the government wants to crack down on him basically is they don't think he should have a monopoly on reared and steel because they want it right they want to own mm -hmm. it and use the other stuff and so the most interesting thing about uh atlas shrugged is there actually are no characters who are behaving in this selfless way that ayn rand thinks is terrible right as far as you get is is uh the main character dagny's brother at one point in the movie goes goes oh that that line that we had running in Mexico is going to help those people uh, right. escape but at the same and like in the same breath he's talking about how they were using it to ship ore out. and he's well he's also <laughs> invested in a mine on mm -hmm. the other end of that line right so he himself has has put himself into a personal uh in a in a position where he would benefit from the success of this ore mine, right, and then his you know his train would be the one shipping the ore out of Mexico, and it just so happens that refugees would be on there too, you know. And what's right, and what's interesting about this is if if objectivism's philosophy was that selfish actions are ult selfless actions are ultimately 
motivated by selfishness because we do selfless things because we also want society to be better for us, I would have some sympathy for it. But that's not the philosophy. The philosophy is selflessness is dumb. But we right. don't see any selflessness really in this. That's the real strange mm -hmm. thing. The other thing that I find interesting, uh, just to, to tackle objectivism too, is objectivism doesn't think the government should be getting invested in any way, except apparently in patents. Now this comes up more <laughs> right. in this comes up more in two, but it's a present here too. Apparently, objectivism they think that companies should be able to go out there and work the best way they can work, and do what they want, and and the people who run the best businesses will invent the best stuff, and won't that be great? Mm -hmm. But they also think that, seem to think it's awesome that the government can stop other businesses from copying your designs. Right, exactly. It's something that that like... seems incongruous to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, it, it's one of those things where it's okay. There's a great, there's a great line where, uh, a great scene where I mean, great as in quotes, great, uh, where a government official is talking to Henry Reardon about, you know, handing over, uh, the formula or something like that to his. Oh, steel. you know what? I know you were being snarky, but I would say this is the closest the movie comes to actually being well written. Okay. Um, I, I think this scene almost works. So he, he's he's doing this, and then Henry just responds with a question, uh, and he repeats this over and over again. He goes, is Reardon Steel good? Is Reardon Steel good? And then, the, of course, the government official is trying to, like, you know, double talk and work around yeah. the question blah blah because and... the government's the government's position is that reared metal is dangerous mm -hmm. and it, they're doing this whole thing and then i can't remember exactly what the question is uh that the government official says to him but henry reardon goes <laughs> goes because it's mine <laughs> It's something like, why won't you just sell it to us and just make it easy on yourself and make yourself rich, you know? Right, right. He goes, like, yeah, because he goes, it's mine. The problem is that, like, great, it's yours. By all means. Cool. It's your steal. Who are you expecting to enforce that? Right. You know, it, I, it's, it's one absolutely. of the... Absolutely. It's one of the... Yeah, like, like Owen said, uh, it's one of the, the major failings of objectivism as a, a philosophy. And in turn, this film is... It it really sets up this this position where the government is evil and, and bad and it's just trying to take uh take the fruits of you know honest workers' labor and and all this sort of thing. But it never addresses the fact that <laughs> uh they themselves benefit from the actions of the government in and at times. Right. Uh, well, I mean it it, it 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 he relies on having a patent on it. You know, mm -hmm. and the movie never goes there. Like, if they had another company, uh, copy Reardon Steel, right? And Henry Reardon had to make a choice between using the power of the government and suing them, right? Mm -hmm. Or facing up to the fact that that would be coercion through the government, and he doesn't think it's a good idea, and he just needs to find a way to keep making Reardon Steel better than the other guy. That would be an interesting movie for objectivism as a philosophy like that that's a legitimately interesting question that i would be interested i want to see that movie reardon versus the reardon copycat and how he handles that right but the problem is they can't answer that question because as soon as they do it falls apart um it's it's strange uh the, the movie <laughs> i mean i feel like we're, we're kind of we we briefed it a bit but it's it's so weird to kind of right. get this movie on a threat because we're a little mm -hmm. all over the place talking about it because the movie itself is all over the place it mm -hmm. jumps from idea to idea so quickly um mm -hmm. and the basic plot is incredibly simple there is a failing railroad company that's trying to repair a line but they don't know if the metal that they want to repair the line with is safe or not or whether it's a conspiracy to make it look unsafe that that is the film right but each, each question takes what feels like weeks to resolve. Um, I, I said it to you before, and I, I still stand by it. it. It's a testament to how boring this film is, that the highlight of the entire movie is B-roll footage of a railroad being replaced. <laughs> that is the most legitimately interesting thing you ever see on screen. Um, yeah. and, and then there are weird things like, 
there are things that should just be cut from this movie, right? Like, the whole thing involving the bridge. We didn't need the yeah. plot involving Reardon repairing the bridge, right? We could have cut mm-hmm. that. Saved a little bit of right. time. And, 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 and really, all that, that does serve is for the, like, romantic subplot. Because basically, like... Like, oh, I built you this bridge as, like, a anniversary gift sort of thing. Right. Uh, it, it, it's like, instead of, instead of oh, I brought you flowers, it's, I built you a bridge. Right. And that, that's pretty much all it serves. Right. And then there's weird things like um, when... So, there, there are some moments I actually think are really interesting. Um, they're a bit old-fashioned and sexist, but the scene where Henry Reardon gives his wife, who mm-hmm. is legitimately awful... She plays yeah. a good, awful wife, but it's a very old stereotype. Rich, you know, the rich bitch who isn't really listening to the husband, you know? <laughs> You're right, right. It's that archetype. So he, he, he gets her a... This is actually one of the more interesting threads in the movie. I think this is an element... Because there are bits in it that work when you can see an actual story trying to come out, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a, a, a whole thread in which Henry Ridden, he gives his wife a bracelet. And it's made from the first paw rings of reared metal that he's done, right? Which I guess he can just do that in his factory. Just be like, hey, would you just, uh, you know, uh, would you paw me like seven Toblerone pieces of, of reared metal, please? <laughs> it's like, oh, it just so happens that Bob, who works on line one, is also a jeweler. Right. Um. Um, but he gets to this this present and she's really excited to get this bracelet and then when it comes out she's that she's that cliche character of like oh you got me the thoughtful gift instead of the big diamond you know she's clearly disappointed Mm -hmm. later on there's a scene where Dagny and Reardon are sleeping together but his wife doesn't know and Dagny um buys the bracelet for his wife at at a dinner party and it's it's actually it's almost thematic you know what I mean right um he she sees that Reardon's wife has this bracelet and has no appreciation for it, so she buys it from her. And, and Reardon's wife is happy to get rid of it, you know, in favor of some jewelry. And they, they also make a little, a little bit of speech about it being, you know, a fair trade and transactional and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Dagny's got to be the capitalist all the time. And they're also making a point there, again, on hypocrisy, like, oh, Reardon's wife, she claims to be all about sentimentality and value and things like that and family, but actually she just wants the the jewelry as well. She just wants what she wants <laughs> right. for the price. Right. Um, and as they're walking out, Reardon says to her, you didn't have to do that. And there's actually a good line. She says, yes, I did. And you know why? Which is saying, you know, because mm-hmm. we're sleeping together. Like, I'm your wife. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm, I'm your woman now. I will take this, this, this piece of jewelry of value. And right. it's almost good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, like I said, the the film is not devoid of enjoyable moments. Uh, I think there are some, some interesting stuff. Like, I've always been a, a kind of a sucker of these, like, kind of corporate uh, espionage, like, sagas. You yeah. know what I mean? Where, like, I, there's something, it's like watching Dune or reading Dune, you know, yeah. where it's, you know, instead of these, you know, great families uh, warring against each other, it's these corporations, and you know, I can kind of, I can get behind that. It's, it can be interesting. Yeah. Uh, so uh, instead of maybe going through the entire plot, let's 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 start pointing out some of the weird stuff that's happened that happens in this movie. Some really strange scenes. Oh, well, I know my favorite right off the bat, and it's okay. it's it's a quirk that comes of. This movie being a movie from the 50s, <laughs> a book from the mm-hmm. 50s, but made in 2011. Um, there's a point in this movie where the government passes a law that says nobody can own more than one company. <laughs> right. Which is a silly law, but it, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's a very childish interpretation of what anti-monopoly laws are all about. Right. Very it's... simplistic. Yeah. But that's basically it. Nobody can own more than one company. So if you own more than one company, you have to immediately sign all your other companies away. And we're treated to this amazing scene where... The goal with this is to, again, get Henry Reardon to give up Reardon Metal. But he decides, I'm going to keep everything except Reardon Metal. Sorry, everything... I'm I'm, I'm going to get rid of everything except Reardon Metal. And there's a scene of him signing away all his industries, and they pop up on the screen as they go, right? Mm -hmm. It's the year 2016. Sorry, 2011. 
Henry. Oh, no, it's 2016 in the movie. It's the year 2016. Yeah. Henry Reardon is signing away his incredibly valuable ore, oil, <laughs> coal, and what was it, like haulage <laughs> industry? Yes, something like that. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Better make sure he doesn't get a monopoly on all that ore. Like. <laughs> Or, uh, and okay, another thing too. Like, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm, I'm thinking that it takes a little bit more to pass over all the assets and whatnot tied into a company in like a 16 page folder. Because like, <laughs> that's what he does. Like every time he, he, they show him signing over this, a company, it's. Him signing a single piece of paper that's bound in a in a folder that I can buy a hundred for like two dollars right. at Office Depot, and it's like here you go, there's my company. It's but like, they also eh, I don't think it works that way. They also have that moment where you get something that almost works too, when he says to his guy Mouch, who's his like friend, mm-hmm. but he's secretly working for the evil government, um, <laughs> and he. He says to him, oh, as far as I'm concerned, it'll always be your company, Hank. You know, if you need, whatever you need, just let me know. And he has quite an intelligent response, which is, it's either my company or it's not, right? Right. You'll either keep your promise or you won't. That's a thought that has value in a film full of thoughts that have no value. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Because it's true. It's either his company officially or it isn't, you know? Therefore... He, like, he has no control over whether this guy will honor his commitments. They do nothing with it. Never comes up. The question of whether or not he will honor his commitments or whether or not he has any... Like, because you, you, when he says that, you think, okay, right, there's going to be a scene maybe later on where he'll go to him and he'll be like, remember, you know? No. It, it no. goes nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> Completely irrelevant. All right. So here's a scene that I thought was really strange. And this is, this is a personal thing for me, all right? So... <laughs> Uh, as we mentioned before, there was this there's this running uh, thread that hap- that pops up like real out of the blue about halfway through the film where Reardon shows up to uh, talk to Dagny and he's like, oh yeah, by the way, I found this picture or like blueprint of this weird engine that super was being train. built. Yeah, this 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 super train engine that was being built. And like, oh, where was that being built? You know, sometime, in Wisconsin. Some, you know, you know, you know, sometime in the last five years during the resurgence of rail. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they go, oh, it was in a factory in Wisconsin, right? And so they, and they kind of leave it at that, and that would have been fine with me, right? But then they keep on going, and, and every like, they, she's like, Henry, that's a cow. I know you haven't been out of the city very much, <laughs> but. <laughs> No, no, look, engine. It's pulling a car. No, it's, it's, it's like a that SpongeBob thing. You're like, it's, it's not just a boulder. It's a rock. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, so every time they mention this, though, they always, they always say, like, oh yeah, that, that, that crazy awesome engine in Wisconsin. Do you know what my favorite they bit about this though is though? The company that made it, they didn't even change that from the book. And so it's this high-tech engine made by the 20th century engineering company. What, like 100 years out of date? <laughs> like... <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so, so they just keep referring to the factory in Wisconsin. The factory in Wisconsin. The factory in Wisconsin. They just... They, they say that, like, at least three or four times. Oh, but are, you, finally... are you suggesting this factory did not live up to... <laughs> Like, if what they're going to build it up, that... you're, you're expecting a good set, right? What, what I'm suggesting is is that Ayn Rand never bothered to actually look up a town name in Wisconsin. Like, there, there's really easy ones they could have used. They could have said uh, Milwaukee, all right? Probably the most well-known city in, in Wisconsin. Madison, all right? Also kind of fairly well-known because it's the capital. I would love like Green Bay, and then there's Eau Claire and La Crosse. These are towns maybe not as well known, but they are towns, and factories do in fact exist. Are you in telling these me towns. there's more than one factory in Wisconsin? I know, crazy, right? Uh, but, so 
what happens is they go to this factory, right? And it's the whole scene. There, there's another weird thing about this scene that I'll get to in a little bit, right? But they <laughs> go there. All right, they go there and they, <laughs> they uncover they uncover the plans for this uh this engine hidden behind like a secret bookcase by the way which is but, well, okay. also very strange it is hidden behind a secret bookcase but it's worth <laughs> mentioning it's not amazingly secret like, no <laughs> first of all first of all this factory has nothing in right like i've been to abandoned right. factories do you know what you gotta do to get them that clean and <laughs> with all the equipment right gone? right and, and yeah and that's the funny thing too is they they say like oh my god people just people just left they just got up and walked out. Like, and, did they take all the machinery with on them, their like on their backs? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> and, uh, it's an empty warehouse, is what it is. Like, it, right? It doesn't look like a factory at all. Um, so, so, so they they find this, and then what happens next is the weirdest montage in in cinema history. Right. The first thing they do is they like, oh we have to find the the owner of this. Of this factory. Like, oh, he still lives in town. And then they reveal the name of the town that they're in. And it's Rome, Wisconsin. And I looked it up. All right, I've, I'm pretty sure I've been there. Uh, it's a real town in Wisconsin. But <laughs> it has like 1,800 people. It is a tiny blip of a nothing town uh, in western Wisconsin. And it's... Like no, no, no freaking uh, high tech factory is ever going to exist in a town like this, right? It just makes no sense because there's not enough people John, John. to run the factory. John, you don't know <laughs> what's going to happen in the five years between 2011 and 2016 when rail makes <laughs> unless, a resurgence. You don't unless know <laughs> all eight unless all 1,800 people in this town worked in that factory, <laughs> like. <laughs> Uh, the factory is not going to exist there. What I'm getting uh, at is, yeah. they said it a little bit too close to the movie, to the year of release, I think. Just a, just a little too close. <laughs> right. Just, just a tad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, so that happens, and then, and then uh, there's a weird montage where they're trying to track down the, the, the current owner of the factory. It's, it's, it's a weird thing. Well, I mean, um, I mean... It, I, I think we're we're kind of downplaying the seriousness of this a little bit, though, because I just, I just want to bring home to people, this is going to get a little emotional... We should probably discuss why the factory went bust, because it really is a, a heart-wrenching story of how this factory went out of business. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're told, we're told through voiceover <laughs> that they clearly added on afterwards. Like, they, they must right. have watched it first and be like, you know what, it's really not hitting home how tragic it, it, it is. It's, it's really not preachy enough. The, 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 the 20th century engineering company went out of business. Because, because, you know, it really was sad for the people who worked there. Mm -hmm. And the incompetence of the bosses who decided one day, for no reason, apparently. And, and, <laughs> and the way they say it, it's almost like, I don't know how Henry Reardon knows, by the way. But he knows this story, right? This, right. this heartbreaking story of, of what happened to the factory. One day, they decided to start paying people according to their needs. <laughs> Not how hard they worked. Right. <laughs> and then it's almost like, you know... <laughs> You know that you know that, that even South worse. Park even chalkboard worse than that. where they're like where they're like uh, step one underpants, step two question mark question mark question mark, step three profit. Do you know what I mean? So it's like step one, pay people according to their needs, not according to how hard they work. Step two, shut down factory. <laughs> <laughs> And this is this it gets is what, even worse than that, right? This so, is what Ayn like, Rand oh, thinks like, socialism Owen is. Owen is not even give, doing this justice, right? So, so how so this plays bad. out is actually is Henry and Dang are walking into this factory, right? You, you can clearly see that they're not actually talking, right? But the, it's filmed through so far away that they do a voiceover of these two. It's talking. like when, it's like when cars drive off into the credits in '80s movies. But the, right. <laughs> but the voice is still like perfectly placed in the center speaker <laughs> right um, and yeah she goes oh what happened and yeah like Owen said what happened <laughs> <laughs> well Mickey <laughs> so, so she asks and yeah, he says that whole line and then she goes uh, well, how does she word it she why goes, would they do goes, such a thing 
<laughs> why why do people keep doing these altruistic things? Don't they know it's only going to hurt everyone in the long run? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Don't they know that helping people will hurt them? <laughs> Not only that, but like this is another example <laughs> of like a batshit insane interpretation of left-wing <laughs> politics. Right. Like, haven't you heard that what people on the left wing really want to do is abolish the concept of promotion and right. <laughs> and wage increases? <laughs> right. <laughs> I I mean, uh, they go. I, I will say there is a recap of this in the sequel. <laughs> oh, good. They, they uh-huh. cover this information again. Uh, and, so, and at uh, one point, Dagny says, "But how do they ascertain who needs the most?" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, what it really feels like is like those um, like really shitty infomercials. Where it's like, like, but but how does the magic bullet blend things so perfectly? Well, glad you asked, Darlene. <laughs> uh, it's our patented cross blade technology <laughs> that at one at once sucks the food down and then chops. <laughs> I want to be at the meeting at 20th Century Engineering where it's like, all right, guys, we got three things on the agenda today. Okay, step one, we invented the miracle engine. It's going to revolutionize modern transport, solve the energy crisis. <laughs> step two, uh, from now on, the lunch, uh, the canteen is going to serve a vegetarian option rather mm-hmm. than uh, on Fridays for everyone. We're all trying to get a little bit healthier, yeah. you know, and uh, right, right. we think we should all chip in. Step three, uh, uh, we're going to uh, cut everybody's pay on the top grade and uh, pay everybody according to their needs. All right, wrapped up. Anyone got any questions? No, no. Just, uh, what? Uh, <laughs> me, no, no, no questions. No questions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because they say that, like, uh, we pay them by their needs. This is like, you, Bill, what do you need? I don't know. A, a new puppy. Done. Uh, Janice, what do you need? Well, my crocheting hooks are a little old. Done. You got it. Uh, you know, just... <laughs> Alice, what do you need? Uh, a new kidney? Oh, oh. Um, mm. was, how, would, uh, <laughs> would stock do? <laughs> so the, the last weird scene I want to cover is actually the ending, um, <laughs> which is hilarious to me. Uh, so spoilers, I guess. So how how this this movie ends up wrapping up right? after they've is, after they've saved the day by proving that rear to metal is great yeah. and breaking the land speed record. Yeah, where, where well. they heroically where they heroically ride a train for fifteen minutes. It's a really um, long scene. Yeah, um, we get to the end. And there's this nice big uh, celebration between uh, two main characters, Henry and Dagny, and then this third ca- uh, character, Ellis, who is this oil baron, who apparently tapped into this unfound uh, ocean of oil in in Colorado. And this is bullshit, by the way, because <laughs> so much of this movie's philosophy, so much of these characters being right, is dependent on there being oil in Colorado. Right. <laughs> Which there um, isn't. Sorry. Uh, at least not that I know of. <laughs> but, um, so... At the very end, we see that, okay, everyone's, you know, celebrating, having a good time. And then Ellis leaves, and then he's um, approached by John Galt. We need to talk about John Galt before the end of this show, actually. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Um, <laughs> so he's approached by them, and he's like, oh, yeah, I can I can take you somewhere amazing, blah, 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 where the rich are allowed to be rich, and everyone jerks off into a golden pools. It's and – he, and he takes off. Ellis just leaves. Um <laughs> But before he leaves, he does something. And it's fucking hilarious to me. It's Dagny, Dagny wakes up and, and she's like, well, where's Ellis? Where's he at? I don't know. Hey, did you hear? Ellis's oil fields are on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so she comes running. She runs through the police barricade, runs to apparently the oil field that was in his backyard. Yes, yeah, he was <laughs> right? living on the oil field. Yeah, uh, he gets there, and there's a sign that says, "I'm on strike. Take what you want. I'm giving it to you as I found it." Right, and in the vista, in the background, it's just a massive oil fire. Right. What it's I want to know is, did he find it on fire? Exactly. And he was like, "Maybe like, there was oh, some oil down there." 
<laughs> yeah. It just so happens this has been burning for 600 years and no one bothered to <laughs> notice it. Can you smell um, burning oil? No. Nah. <laughs> just Colorado. <laughs> you know, you're used to it. <laughs> There's like dinosaur dang. skeletons rolling down the hill on fire, like, oh, Colorado. <laughs> but then Dagny does something that's just the most over-the-top dramatic thing you can do in a movie, right? So the, the fields are on fire, there's a sign there, and she just drops to her knees, she's like, Aah! end of part one. <laughs> The oil. What's so great what? about this is what's really so great about this is apparently, Ayn Rand wasn't just interested in like the virtue of selfishness, but the virtue of if I'm leaving town, fuck you. <laughs> right. It's, it's like okay, well, <laughs> it, may, it, just, it makes no sense. Where it's like, all right, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take off to go to this apparently utopia for rich people. Um, which surely will never have a need for oil. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to set the last great reserve of oil in the, in the planet, apparently, in Colorado, on fire. I'm just going to burn it all. Because, <laughs> yeah, that's going to make it really Leave it easy. Leave it out, it. I mean, and that's, that's the whole... Okay, let's, let's get into John Galt, right? So John there's Galt, something really weird about John Galt. It's 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 a quite a minor plot in this part of the movie, but all mm -hmm. the way through the movie, people are essentially leaving. Someone quits their job. It's a really good job, but they quit their job working for Dagny to, to just disappear. And all the way through, whenever anybody asks where they're going or where so so and so disappeared to, they say, "Who is John Galt?" Which apparently in the universe of this movie is a, like a known phrase that means, "Who knows," you know. Yeah, it it, it, it it means uh don't ask unanswerable questions. Right. But John Galt is also specifically a person Yeah. Who it is heavily implied designed the magic engine, right? Yes. Um mm -hmm. how long ago was this magic engine designed? How old is John Galt? And how has this <laughs> phrase entered the public lexicon? Like Right. Uh, because this, this doesn't gel with... And, and is this all since t t 2016, 2011, the <laughs> reemergence of the railway lines? Because... Anyway. Um, yeah. But periodically through this movie, rich, successful, selfish people <laughs> will be approached by a shadowy figure. He's basically Rorschach. <laughs> right. <laughs> And it's difficult because anytime someone asks him a question, Except not he's like, as personable. Right. It, it's difficult because anytime someone asks him who he is and starts confronting him, he has to like it takes like twenty minutes. He's like, hold on, just setting up the flagpole. And he's hoisting the American flag. He's like, hold on, let me just get my boombox. <laughs> Sorry, no, that's the Le Versailles. Yes. Uh, that and the Le Marseille. Uh, the national anthem plays. The the flag waves, mm -hmm. and and he speaks. Uh, metaphorically, this doesn't actually happen in the film. Oh, he but, might as well. The, yeah. This character, it, like, so this, like he has he has scoped out every weirdly lit corner in the country because that's all he ever appears in is like just oddly backlit spaces where everyone else is seen perfectly fine, right? You can you can see the guy he's talking to just fine. You can you can see everyone else, all the details of the scenery just fine. But apparently he just lives in this constant state of shroud. It's, you know? it's, it's another amazing example of the heroes of the movie being, being presented in the film language of villains. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, <laughs> but he speaks like, okay, so um, if I remember rightly, the actor playing John Galt is the director of this movie. Uh, of course. Which is why he has a voice that does not in any way fit in with the rest of the movie. <laughs> he does not act well. And every line is the worst. Like, right. it, I kept expecting him to be like, so end the sentence with, so book a holiday now with sandals. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it makes me question how, how amazing these uh, capitalists <laughs> are. Right? Because... 
they're all swayed by this like really vague bullshit um, brochure uh, speech about this amazing place that John Galt has set up, right? Right, like, what are the and promises? Like, it's a place where people can still keep the fruits of their labor. Mm-hmm. It's a place where hard work is rewarded. Sorry, what? Is it the youth club down the road? <laughs> right. Like, I've heard like, these promises. It, it, so the weirdest thing about this, right, is, like, how intelligent could these guys possibly be? Because they're approached by this guy in a trench coat and a weird hat, and he and gives like, oh, you must, bullish- be Gold, you must be John Galt, nice to meet you. And then the trench coat opens, like, oh, hello! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> So, so you're John, and that's the Galt, huh? <laughs> that's not John Galt at all. <laughs> but I am intrigued. Um, <laughs> Is it cold but, in uh, Atlantis? <laughs> so yeah, he he sways these guys on this bullshit promise of this Atlantis uh, utopia place, and these guys just go. The, the problem is, is that these guys are all successful based on an industry and an infrastructure that they abandon to go to a new place right. to apparently do it again? Like, yeah. No, that's not how that works. And, and when they get there, is there not going to already be another really cool banker? Is, you know? it's Right. I like the idea ugh. that when they get there, John Galt runs, like, one really big company, and they're like, no, no, you got to start at the bottom. Objectivism. <laughs> Hard work. You'll be rewarded. Right, the first right. six See, months, I'll just how, cleaning how shit off the is... toilet walls. <laughs> so, basically, how it works when you're here in Atlantis, right? All right, so we got, we have me. I'm here at the top, right? And I have uh, three people beneath I've me. I've recruited you. Now, you've got to go in the shadows, put the trench coat on, and recruit Three more people. <laughs> right. And when and, they recruit what, three what, people. <laughs> <laughs> have you, have, are you familiar with Lululemon leggings? So, so, so what's this all about? What you need to do is sell these nutritious energy bars <laughs> to five more billionaires for which you'll make a commission. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what really, what really, uh, drives Atlantis here is what we like to call thrive <laughs> drive no no thrive it's a uh, <laughs> neutronics um, a neurotropic health drink that at one point increases your metabolism but also removes the carbs and increases ketones <laughs> um excuse me you said we'd be free to innovate here and you will and you will all you have to do is just sit through <laughs> one presentation yeah. You're absolutely you're absolutely free to sell Thrive however you feel <laughs> you can. <laughs> but I build rail railways. Right, the Thrive Railway. <laughs> <laughs> the railway to success through Thrive. <laughs> um yeah, John Galt's re- ridiculous. Um his tone, yeah, I, I, you can't I, believe how bad his tone of voice is until you see the movie. Like, how <laughs> how on the nose... It's like Sam the American Eagle from The Muppets, you know what I mean? It is mm-hmm. it is so on the nose and unpleasant to hear. I, I, I can't... I, it, it feels like going to the Hall of Presidents, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's so bad. Right. Well, I, so, I really don't got much else to say about the film. It's it's a terrible film. It's It's not well done. Um, and it basically tries to beat a philosophy over you with a plush sledgehammer. Thing. Yeah. I, I will say, if it comes to recommendations, I will say this is actually a really unusual movie that's worth watching for one thing alone. It is genuinely weird to see a movie, a book from the 1950s adapted into a movie so unadaptedly, if you know what I mean. <laughs> very little is adapted. It is a very rare example of a book being put right on the screen as written. Um, and that is unusual. It, it is very, very weird because of it. I would also say, um, however, this is not a so bad it's good movie in a lot of ways. No. It's quite boring. Mm-hmm. It's quite... It's, it's quite upsetting, actually, at times, mm-hmm. to think that there are people who, 
who genuinely think like that. Right. And that, that's uh, right there. That's that's the biggest issue. Is that you can tell that there's passion in this film, but not for the act of filmmaking, but for the subject matter. And yeah. the subject matter sucks. Yeah. Um I suppose the last thing I have to say is my favorite character in this movie is Ellis Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> Because, like, he is basically... Do you remember the billionaire from DuckTales? I forgot his name, but he was like the he was like the bad Scrooge McDuck. Okay. Ellis Wyatt makes this guy look, like, <laughs> modest. He's so rich. He's fat. He's not attractive. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't, like, I don't hold that against people. I'm a fat, not attractive guy, right? But he yeah, is... Yeah, you are. He is like I mean, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Potter from It's a Wonderful Life. You know what I mean? <laughs> he is the worst movie villain villain billionaire, right? right? He's the closest thing this guy has to the ultimate hero you're supposed to look up to. He the movie treats him like Santa Claus, right? Like, <laughs> well, and it's great too because like the first time you're really introduced to him, he's a misogynist. Yes, like he he doesn't want to deal with Dagny because he doesn't trust her. You know, as a judgment, he won't shake her hand. He, he, he basically yells at her in her own office, and she just kind of cowers away. Um, it's a really, really unsettling scene. But the minute that he's like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna give you money to start this rail line," they become best friends. Yeah. <laughs> he becomes lovely. Oh, we should probably talk as well before we go, and then we do have to finish up about that train scene. No. So this is kind of like the highlight of the movie, right? The in- Sorry, the intended highlight of the movie. This is the, supposed to be the punch <laughs> the air bit, right? When after the whole movie of them basically complaining about Riot and Metal, they get on the train and they prove that it's safe. Mm-hmm. And there's a moment when they have one train driver on there, like the only one who'd take the job because the unions... That's a really funny scene too, the union scene. Right. Uh, the unions won't let anybody ride the trains, basically, because <laughs> it's unsafe. And they get one guy to ride the train, and then Henry and Dagny get aboard this train, and they do this journey, the John Galt line, the the journey to, to finally repair this horrible damaged train line with rid and metal and fix it once and for all. And they're really proud of this scene, because it goes on like six weeks. There's just it's just like left shot of the of the train and then front shot and side shot. But there's a really funny bit where this is I should clarify, this is before they find the magic train engine. There's a bit where the train driver goes, and we just hit 200 miles an hour, the fastest any train's ever gone in the USA. <laughs> I'm like, why? It's just a train. <laughs> I know that right. <laughs> the rear and metal is good, but it doesn't make trains go faster, does it? I mean, if anything, maybe it could ease up by like friction, but I don't know. But I, here's the thing: like, I don't care how awesome your your fucking metal is, uh, your on your train tracks. You're not taking a hairpin turn, going 200 miles an hour. It's, you're just not doing it. Like that's. I'm not even a physics student, and I know that's not how physics work. Anyone who's had a train set kind of gets this. It's a bad right. film. It it's yeah. it's a very bad film. Uh, we are. Uh, let's call it a day there then. We'll, we'll wrap up for yeah. our first episode of Bad Adaptations. Uh, oh, I'll tell mm-hmm. you what, then. Let's let's end with our final question. Jonathan, is this sure. a bad adaptation or a good adaptation? This, sir, uh, wholeheartedly is a bad adaptation. There we go. And uh, we'll be back in two weeks' time with another possibly bad adaptation, possibly good adaptation, where we'll be doing yeah. uh, Assassin's Creed, a movie based on a video game. Mm-hmm. Which I think this is another one where I I have already seen this and you have not. Is that correct? I had no, I have not seen it. I, I are you looking forward to it? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's good to know. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for watching, everybody, and uh, I hope you now enjoy being played out by some charming royalty-free music I haven't chosen yet. Uh, bye bye. Have a good one. <laughs>